reason not to let us in on Tuesday. And so to continue to adhere to some ridiculous two-week notification process uh, you know, doesn't allow us to conduct the kind of oversight. A look inside. Lawmakers finally get inside the detention shelter in Homestead the housing migrant children, and you'll hear what they found. This is not a moment to point fingers, as my, uh, my colleague just spent all of this time doing. This is a moment to find solutions. Parties apart, universal opposition to separating families, but little consensus on how to proceed. Kids in custody crying and calling out for their moms and dads. You will hear from those in our community dealing with their trauma. Good morning to you. Great to be with you this morning for a special edition of This Week in South Florida. And it is all about the children. The consequences of those family separations at the border now halted is very much our local story. Three facilities holding these children who have been separated from their parents are located here in South Florida. The largest is the Homestead Temporary Shelter for Unaccompanied Children, second largest facility of its kind in the country. About 1,100 teens ages 13 to 17 are being held there. And we believe 70 kids are there who were recently separated from their families at the Mexican border. Another 125 younger children, 12 and under, taken from their parents are being held at his house in North Dade. 70 more are at the Children's Village in Cutler Bay. Yesterday, several members of Congress from South Florida were allowed to tour the Homestead Shelter. Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz was one of those lawmakers, and she learned just this week that the Homestead facility had been reactivated and the population there is growing. And the Congresswoman joins us right here at the table this morning. Great to have you in. Welcome. Good to be with you as always. Glad you're here. Let's begin with a very basic question. Tell us what you saw yesterday. What are your impressions of this homestead shelter? Well, I'll tell you, my, my first impression was five days ago when Senator Nelson and I were denied access to the facility, even though we requested about half a day in advance that, that we'd be given access, um, I, I was left after yesterday's tour with the question mark, what was it that they didn't want us to see on Tuesday that was okay to see yesterday? If the children that are there are being uh, treated the, and the facility looks the way it does, as I saw yesterday, yeah. then there shouldn't have been any reason why they d denied us access. It, it's a bare bones facility. Um, you certainly wouldn't want your child, no one would want their child living in a place like this permanently, but they were adequately cared for clean, and it was clean. Clean, humane, they're being fed three times a day. Yes, there they have some educational program, recreation. They, they are being adequately cared for, but you know, no one would want to be forcibly separated from their children, and it doesn't matter how well cared for they are. Uh, they shouldn't. Those 70 children in particular shouldn't be there. You know, the, uh, this particular facility, we've been reporting this week, this has been open several times over the past couple of years right. under the Obama administration and this administration, mostly, for, and still, mostly for unaccompanied minors right. who also are without their parents but have come across the border on their own, right. a, a very different circumstance, but still kids without their parents. Right. And there is a lot of questioning about these tours, both for you and other lawmakers and for the media this week. Uh, that were managed and staged, and there's privacy concerns for the kids, of course. Do you have any suspicion that there's something that you didn't see? We've talked to a lot of workers, I will say, who uh, I'm confident that these people are being cared for. Again, like you said, not the ideal conditions. Are, do, you, are, do you have any concerns that you did not see something important? Well, of course. I mean, what's the reason why uh, not only Senator Nelson and I, but but many members of Congress all across the country have been denied access to the facilities upon request. Uh, if, there's, if they're being well cared for, if the conditions are, are as they should be, I mean, we've got in some cases, we've seen that there are kids who are essentially being housed in cages in other facilities in the in country. In Texas. In Texas. I mean, but that, is that a, that's a temporary well, way station of booking or processing. There, I don't, I don't, I, know I don't what think it we've is, gotten reports of kids in cages being detained in cages for the long term as, as um, is here. I, I'm not aware that those kids in cages are in any different situation than the ones I saw in Homestead yesterday, except that they are being housed in cages. And so... 
essentially, I mean, and I, I passed an amendment in the appropriations bill the other day that after this, I had this experience that required, and that was accepted by the Republican majority because all members of Congress uh, are, are outraged that we are being denied access to these facilities upon request. Uh, we have to protect the children. They obviously have to make sure that, uh, that they're prepared for us. But for HHS to be telling us that we have to give them two weeks notice before yeah. we can be admitted to a facility is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about the so-called tender age shelters. Yeah. There are two in Miami-Dade County, right. uh, and one is at his house, uh, which is in North Miami-Dade, and then in Cutler Bay, right. Catholic Services runs another called uh, Monsignor Walsh uh, Children's Village. Uh, these, sometimes these are children. I mean, four, five, six years old, and should you be able to go in and see those facilities as well? Certainly, and I've requested to be able to see both of these facilities, and I'm optimistic now that I'm going to be given an opportunity to do that. Um, of course, we were told on the way down to Homestead on Tuesday that we would be able to tour the Homestead facility, and when we got there, we were, we were uh, denied. So I'm optimistic that I'll be able to see one of those, one of those, or one or both of those facilities. But look, Michael, there's, um, and Glenna, there, there's, it doesn't have to be this way. The, 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 the U.S. government under the Trump administration is choosing to forcibly separate these children from their families and then house them in these shelters against their parents' will um, when they have alternatives, alternatives like that, that, have, that we've used before that are far less expensive. It's $4. Give us, give us an example. Just to give you an idea, they have an alternative monitoring program where they can put a bracelet on a parent they, it's a very effective option. It has 90-90% compliance where wearing a bracelet, the parent is released into the community to, you know, to family uh, along with the children and because they have a monitor, they are able to come back and be kept track of because it's a GPS monitor. There's also a community monitoring program where they're assigned a social worker that ensures that they can help find housing and connect with relatives and also return for their court dates. You know, critics, Those are less expensive yeah. and they are also less restrictive and don't require separating children from their families. Uh, of course. But what, what critics would say is, you know, President Trump and his administration in making this zero tolerance policy was fulfilling a campaign promise that he said he would do that. And these family separations are, are collateral damage of that, no doubt. But what critics would say is, if you treat people with children coming across the border illegally differently than you would without children crossing the border illegally, that provides an incentive for people to bring children with them to get that those incentives and those special treatments. How there's do you no, there's that? no special treatment here. In fact, this is just the most bizarre thing. The, the Trump administration in the president's budget for FY18 and FY19, the, the, the appropriations bill we're considering now, has requested funding for alternative programs to make sure that they can monitor immigrants when they are released, undocumented immigrants when they're released, and that they can ensure that they come back for their court dates. We gave them $1.4 billion more for ICE, and they still have chosen to end the, the monitoring program with, with using bracelets and end the community, the community care program. This is purely because President Trump um, has uh, uh, the, the most bigoted and vile feelings about immigrants. You know, he continues to call them vermin and to suggest that the people coming across the border are associated with gangs. It's disgusting and we, unnecessary. Can we just be um, factually speaking this morning, right before we came on our air about uh, 40 minutes ago, the president went on a little tweet storm, Shocking. as he's known to do. And I think we have some mm -hmm. um, graphics so that you can see exactly what those tweets say. And he was talking about the people coming across the border. I'm going to find them while we're here talking in here. Okay, you got it. Yeah. Uh, the tweet at 11.04 says, we cannot allow all of these people to invade our country. When someone comes in, we must immediately, with no judges or court cases, bring, bring them back from where they came. Um, so let's just stop there and drill down into that first line. It, I, um, is there a constitutional way to, for this country to receive people requesting asylum without a judge or court system? No, and it's clear that the president is descending into maniacal, uh, uh, dictatorial, autocratic belief in what his powers are. That is completely unconstitutional, unacceptable, outrageous, and harkens back to a time when 
we uh, enslaved people and separated parents from their from their children yeah. involuntarily when they came on ships to this country by force. Uh, it harkens back to uh, to t a time when we turned ships away, people fleeing, uh, only to send them back to perish in the Holocaust. Uh, if the president actually believes that he can do something like that with no use of our justice system, then this is someone who has forfeited his understanding mm -hmm. and, and right to hold the presidency. You, you are an attorney, so let I me just... I am not an attorney. I Never have were. been an well, attorney. All nope. right, well then, <laughs> but you, you're quite aware... I play one on TV, though. <laughs> you're, you're quite, excuse me, you're quite aware of the law, which yes. I'm not an attorney either, but it says anyone who presents at a U.S. port of entry and seeks asylum, right. that is a civil claim, and they have a political, a legal right, That's right. to do so. Now, somebody and this administration crosses, is denying people who are trying to seek asylum, arresting them, putting them into an immigration detention center in a, in a prison, and, and trying to force them to go to court to send them back without even allowing them to ask for asylum. Well, I have heard, I heard a report on NPR this week that, that said that. The, the question here really largely is all the, the people who are trying to cross the border illegally. Those are the ones who have really raised the ire of President uh, Trump and other people across the country. So um, they're from Honduras, Guatemala, uh, El Salvador, El Salvador mm -hmm. principally, violent countries. Uh, what's the best approach here? I mean, we have been working in those countries to try to better their situation. The best approach is to pass comprehensive immigration reform. We have the lowest rate of un undocumented immigrants coming to this country that we've had in modern times. We have the ability, we could do it this week. You know, we could pass comprehensive immigration reform, which would include strong border security, which would include allowing a pathway to our, to our dreamers to have a pathway to citizenship, which would ensure that we could have a diverse type of immigrant come to this country, whether it's through you know, students who are coming to this country who want to remain and will improve the, the, uh, the, yeah. the expertise we have in this country, or farm workers and, and construction workers yeah. who the, the, our economy vitally needs. but. The Republican leadership in Congress refused to take up legislation well, we to do have that. a Republican member of Congress, your colleague Mario Diaz-Balart, is going to be here in just a minute. We're going to talk about the immigration reform bill that was supposed to be voted on on Friday. But well, it, that immigration reform it, bill is, is, is also vile and would, right, would, well, would you, go much too far. You, you, don't, you don't care for that bill? Doesn't appear that bill may come to a vote at all. Unlikely. As far as we, but let's ask, let's ask Congressman diaz Blurt. Thank you so much. Thanks You're for welcome. coming. Appreciate Thank you. you being here. And as you heard, Congressman Mario Diaz Villard is next. Stay with us.
Under mounting pressure from Congress and the public, the president on Wednesday, as you know, did an about face and signed that executive order stopping the family separations at the border. And then on Friday, the president told Congress it should stop wasting its time on immigration. That's a quote until after the midterms in November. And one of the members of Congress who has been a chief advocate for immigration reform for at least the past five years is Mario diaz Ballard, Republican from the 25th Congressional District here. Congressman, great to have you come in. Great pleasure. Let's begin with the bill that was with you and Representative Carlos Corbello and a number of other uh, Republicans have mm -hmm. been pushing for. Uh, on Friday, Speaker Ryan said, no, we're not going to vote on this bill. Is this bill dead? It's not dead, but it is very difficult to pass uh, this kind of legislation through Congress. Uh, I'm not going to give up. I think we have a shot at, 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 at having a bill that can pass the House uh, this uh, upcoming week. You have in the bill, you have a copy with, it, with you. You just took it out during right. the commercial break. We went through it a little bit. Uh, just a few minutes ago, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz called it vile. However, it sounds like you're swallowing a bitter pill in compromising on some things. Others are. What, what is it about this bill that's not going forward? Well, well, no, there's, there's, uh, look, if, if it was just me doing the bill, it wouldn't look like this. It would be different. But this is a bill that is reasonable. Now, what I pointed out are all, of the, all the things that you keep hearing that are horrible in the bill, about the triggers, about the $1,000 fine, about the merit uh, point system, about uh, the eliminating the diversity visa. All these points that I keep hearing are so horrible in this bill are, this is analysis, not of this bill, of the bipartisan bill that passed the Senate. And a lot of the same individuals that praise that bill and a lot of the same organizations that praise that bill all of a sudden hate this bill, even though it has pretty much the same issues, in many cases, pretty much identical. Yeah. Yeah. What are the, one of the, excuse me, one of the important provisions, favorable conditions, according to, I think, Lena and me anyway, to speak personally, uh, about this bill is that it protects dreamers, yes. gives them legal status and a path to citizenship. I mean, that is just so critical for our community and for the country, 1.7 million people. I agree. I, I, look, and that's, so again, as I said, there are parts that I wish were different. But the key for me is that this would immediately legalize, not DACA. DACA is anywhere between 650 to 850,000. Right. The Dreamers, DACA eligible population, give them legality, permanency, and citizenship opportunities. Immediately, they could become a citizen if they qualify for the current routes. And then we're creating this additional route for them and another group of individuals. Uh, again, if this would happen, it would be the first time that the House would pass a bill to legalize and give permanency and legality to not the DACA folks, all of the Dreamers. That's a huge issue. Now, in order to do so, some folks say we need to strengthen the border to not have another two million, obviously, two years all from right. now. Well, this bill does provide $25 billion for border security, Correct. which is a euphemism really for the wall. Correct. Correct. Which is, by the way, about half of the money that was in the bipartisan Senate bill for border security that yeah. passed the Senate with both Republican and Democratic votes. Right. You know what, what I think, this is what upsets me. We're in, a, in a, an era now where folks will be critical of things before they've seen it. This, this bill was being criticized before anybody had the opportunity to see it. Now again, is it perfect? No. Are there parts that can be improved, should be improved, and maybe yeah. even taken out? Yes. But is it responsible? Absolutely. It's very similar on the border security aspects in some cases less severe All right. uh, than the Senate bipartisan Senate bill that a lot of the folks who were criticizing this supported then. So what's the biggest hang up? The path to legalization for opponents of any sort of legalization who will call it amnesty. Correct. That That is the buzzword. Correct. H how do you get by that absolute tenet of some of many people in this sure. country that if you're here illegally it's just not going to work? And, and, that, and that's, their, look, what has killed these efforts in the past, and I've been involved with it, this issue when Democrats were in control, when Republicans were in control, are the extremes, the extreme on the right and the extreme on the left. Yeah. There are some folks that say anything, even a, a, a pathway towards earning the ability to get right with the law, earned, adhering to the rule of law, is unacceptable. And some, for some other folks, anything that might secure the border is, is unacceptable. So I'm trying to work to get this thing to the center. 
I want to have solutions that make an impact on the country and the people that I represent. This bill would be a, state f a step forward, not a perfect one, but a major step forward, and it legalizes all the dreamers. And if yeah. the president would get behind it instead of tweeting against it, which he did on Friday, wouldn't that be the holy grail of pathways to consensus? Mm -hmm. Glenn, one of the interesting things, it doesn't matter how good or bad it, it is, if you don't have the president's willingness to sign a bill, yeah. it's off or not. And that's one of the things that we have to also obtain. Yeah, we should also note that, in fact, you have uh, a very good relationship with President Trump. I mean, you have had private conversations with him on a number of occasions, Including and you issue. have talked with him about this. Yeah. Now, I have also, I have things where I agree with Mr. with the President, and I have things where I disagree. I don't yeah. agree with well, him. Well, you disagree with him on, a lot on of the separation, separation of these kids from their Absolutely. parents. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you this, issued a strong statement Absolutely. to that effect. That's part of, that's part of this bill, is, the, a, is a legislative path there's to three things, ending family separation. Three major parts. I mean, there's a lot of technical issues, but there yeah. are three major parts of this bill. Number one is that it, it legalizes the dreamers with a real potential pathway to citizenship. Number two is it stops the separation of minors from their parents at the border. And number three is, is that it secures the border. On all of those aspects, we can talk about how it's not perfect, but there's no other bill that has a shot of passing the House, and, and that's why this is an important opportunity. Do you plan to go down to this homestead facility or his house or the Monsignor Brian Walsh uh, Children's Village to get a first-hand look you at know, these I've, children? I've done that in the past. I've had the opportunity of, I've toured a lot of facilities, including, by the way, in the southern border. And, and one of the things that, that I think, by the way, is highly unacceptable is for any federal department or agency to tell members of Congress mm -hmm. that they cannot go in their oversight uh, capabilities to review those facilities. And so that's one of the things that, uh, that I'm hoping uh, will never happen again. I know that, again, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and I have a lot of disagreements, but we agree that members of Congress, as, as the representatives of the people, have the right, and we need to be able to go look at facilities unannounced to make sure that yeah. things are not happening improper. I'm glad to hear that what she saw and others uh, saw here in South Florida are the same things that I've seen in other parts of the country that these folks are being treated humanely, but we should never, if at all avoidable, separate minor kids from their parents. So with that executive order, which, which changed that overnight, changed that, and according to some members of the president's own party, including Senator Marco Rubio we spoke with this week, changed it without sort of the capacity to handle the consequences of it. And then just as uh, we came on the air today, the news breaking from, in paper, from the Department of Homeland Security is that there is now a reunification process. There is tracking in place. It's underway. We have no details. Uh, do you? Have any details no, about what that's about? I think that's all, those are positive signs. Positive uh, signs, think, but the details, the well, devil the, is in the details. The of devil's that. in the detail. Yeah. Those are very positive signs. Now, I will tell you that we still need to find a long term solution because, just like to me, it is wholly unacceptable. And it's the worst thing we could ever do is, is separate minor kids from their parents. That's going to be the last option. We have to look at everything before that. There's also the, real, the, the fact that we have porous borders and that. The coyotes, these are not individuals, the coyotes, the, the, the same folks that are uh, the ones that do human trafficking and drug tra trafficking, they know that we have a broken system and that if you can get kids here, um, that that creates all sorts of problems. We have to stop that for the sake of the kids and we have to have a system that works, which is why legislation is going to be essential. You know, I frankly, looking at statistics from border and customs and border protection, you know, how porous is the border? Because in the year 2000, there were 1.7 million illegal immigrants who were picked up on the border. Last year, there were roughly 351,000. So the numbers are going down. I mean, the president in the tweet this morning said immigrants are overrunning our borders. They're pouring into the country. In fact, the numbers seem to be going the other way. Michael, I don't think that the, the, here, here's the reality. The United States has the same right, I would tell you, responsibility that every other country does to determine who comes in and who leaves. Of course. When you ask how, uh, how, how bad is it, I've been to the southern border. There are areas that we control, the United States controls, and there are other areas where we don't control. And here's the other thing, that the southern border are, is controlled almost entirely by the cartels. So this is not 
This is organized crime. The Mexican side. Yeah, the Mexican side is controlled by the cartels. So anything we can do to make sure that we can stop human trafficking, drug trafficking. And you know who the real victims are? The kids. Those are victims. Those ch children that are being separated from their parents, yeah. they're victims. So we have to stop the victimization of all of these folks. You do that by having a system that works. You do that by having a, a legal system that works. You also have to have a system that adheres to the rule of law. None of that applies right now. And so it's true that one day, you know, the numbers are up. Uh, the, other, the other day, the numbers are down. We have to have a system that works. We don't have a, it's almost impossible to um, immigrate legally to the United States under certain circumstances right now. That shouldn't be the case. We export or deport people who have been here for years, who we have yeah. asked to come over. So we have to fix that system. The well, best way to start is by legislation, well, and I'm hoping... You, you've just framed two decades of immigration absolutely, issue right absolutely. there. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and I'll tell you what, I will continue working on this. Because to me, the most important thing is not the partisan divides, is getting results. You all know that I have a pretty good record of getting results even on difficult things. Yeah. This has been the most difficult thing, but I'm not going to stop working on All it right. until we're we get results. The, we're going to make the final word. Thank you, Mario diaz Balart. Great Always to have you come in. Great to have we'll see you back with your opponent in maybe October. Hope so. Up next, we turn to two leaders in our community who are right now on the front lines for the children brought here without their parents. Stay with us. This is what it looked like yesterday afternoon down in Homestead. Hundreds of citizens expressing sympathy for the migrant children and opposition to the Trump administration policy that uh, was put into place. They want those kids reunited with their parents as soon as possible. Some in our community are on the front lines of advocating for the children who were brought here. Cheryl Little is the executive director of Immigrants for uh, Americans for Immigrant Justice, a nonprofit that for years has provided free legal services for migrants and now is providing lawyers for those unaccompanied, unaccompanied migrant children. 
Dr. Judy Schechter is chair of pediatrics at the UM Medical School and chief of service at Holtz Children's Hospital. She sent out a letter this week urging colleagues in the medical community to protest the family separation policy and quick reunification of the children with their parents. So great to have you we both are here. Very Thank happy you. that you were here, yeah. Dr. Schechter, Ms. Little, and let me just say full disclosure. I am a supporter of AIJ, and I have even written a modest check to support your work, which uh, I really support and uh, think is great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Dr. Schechter, let me begin by asking you, give us an assessment of the emotional, psychological damage that is being done to these children, particularly the young children who are separated from their parents. Well, of course, for these children, I can't exactly comment because none of us have been there and right. spoke and, and even if you were you wouldn't be able to <laughs> comment specifically. that's what and i understand. understood understood um, yeah. but we know that family separation is very damaging to children we know that from 40 50 60 years of research right. we know that from the um, often cited ace or um, adverse childhood event studies and so the harm that this can do to health both near and long term including cardiovascular disease cancer early death is profound, as is the stunting to a child's development, the behavioral outcomes they have, the mental health issues that they will have with anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. um, and, and the possibility, particularly for how the, what these kids have been through previously for post-traumatic post stress disorder and triggering those events. And there would be a, a time factor in that too. Wouldn't, wouldn't that make sense if a child is, the longer they're separated and the and sort of the circumstances by which they're separated all play into that. Yes, and we don't know how long. We've, I mean, I've heard certain reports of kids that were separated from their moms in May um, and are only, you know, just a couple of whom have been reunited. We have no idea how long this would be. So the longer that is, the, the questions that aren't answered for these children, who has more resilience and who doesn't, whether from their life circumstance beforehand, the younger children, it, this is very yeah. harmful. Yeah, uh, Cheryl Little, you and your attorneys at AIJ have been going for years, you know, into various shelters where uh, migrants are held and now you are designated to represent some of these unaccompanied minors. How hard is that? Huh. Well, can I just start by talking about why these kids flee and why their parents of are course. fleeing? Okay. So Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras are among some of the most dangerous countries in the world. Um, these vicious gangs, these drug cartels act with impunity. Um, people have nowhere to go for protection. Um, in those three countries, homicides are at record numbers, okay? Uh, boys are told, you know, join gangs or pay with your life. Uh, young girls are raped. Uh, kids see dead bodies on their way to school. A lot of kids are afraid to go to school because the gangs are waiting to recruit them. Right. It's terrible. Uh, parents, you know, um, old, older, older folks, uh, they have had brothers, fathers, uh, you know, lots of family members killed. Um, and these and are first-hand stories. That these you, are first-hand stories, okay? These people know, most of them, how dangerous a journey they're about to undertake. They do it anyway because in a many, many cases, they think it's the only way to really re remain safe and save the yeah. lives of their and lives and the lives of the kids. Tremendous risks uh, coming here from Central America across, you know, uh, all the way up through Mexico. It's an incredibly dangerous voyage. There's no question about that. And you know, when I hear certain officials in Washington talking about how it's the gang members from MS-13 coming in, no. These kids, and they're, they're fleeing the MS-13 gang members who are trying to recruit them and who have threatened to kill them if they're not recruited. Uh, there was a program um, uh, under Obama at one point. It was a very flawed program. We complained about it. Um, but it enabled certain children to apply for refugee status while in their home countries. And mm. Trump has ended that program. All right. Hold your thoughts for a minute. We'll be taking a break, and we'll be right back.
We are back talking about the medical and legal challenges with these unaccompanied and separated children from their families. Cheryl Little, you go to these shelters to try to advocate legally. Um, we spoke with the lawmakers here and just reading between the lines, it sounds like it's very difficult for someone who is 10 or younger to be put in front of a judge in this legal process that they deserve and are entitled to and and say what? Answer what questions? Advocate for staying, leaving, being with their parents, asylum? How, how does that even work? We're the only agency authorized to go into the, the shelters here in South Florida that are government run to advise kids about their basic rights and then determine whether or not they might have a claim for relief from removal. Um, in addition to that, um, we represent children in immigration court. And so let me give you two examples. We represent an eight-year-old Guatemalan boy. Um, uh, he, there, he's from an, uh, an indigenous community, um, speaks a rare dialect. Uh, he and his dad arrived at the border. Um, and according to Pedro, I'll call him Pedro, um, uh, they were five approached by five Border Patrol agents. Um, Pedro says he saw his dad thrown to the ground and stomped on, um, and Pedro was separated from his dad. We have been trying to find his father for close to a year because mm. this happened in July, and we've been unable to. We represent a three-year-old girl, Anna. Uh, who they arrived at a designated port of entry. She arrived with her dad. Her mother is deceased. Um, when you ask her her age, she holds up three fingers. The challenge for us these days um, is how do we best represent these children? Mm -hmm. First of all, you have to build trust. And let's remember they arrived traumatized, okay? How do we, I'm sorry, did you no, want to? I just, you know, your question, Glenna, was about how they're represented. And I, my hat's off to you all for trying. But this is just so wrong. How does an eight-year-old go on for a year, pass through birthdays, with having last seen his father thrown to the ground, and, and not have trauma from that that will be lifelong. Are, if are he's you? ever reunited, there's going to be problems in terms of trust and blame and what that does to a family. So it sounds like the question here is, how do you bridge strict immigration laws and the people caught in this system with a humane process that addresses just what you're talking about? So Glenna, this isn't political for me. Yeah. I understand that politics got us here. I understand that policy can change this including reunification right now. But this is about children. It's about child health. It's about child well-being. It's about life course changes. It shouldn't happen, and it doesn't have to happen. We are better than this. Cheryl, when, when you're in court, I, there is a chance, is there not, that if a, a child is here without their parents, they might not want asylum. They might want to go home. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's part of the challenge, and in fact, when um, the three-year-old was in court uh, a while back. I, the judge looked concerned as well. Um, we have these huge questions. You know, how do we determine the basis of whatever claim there may be for relief to remain here? And then, how do we decide whether or not that child would want to remain here? These are incredible questions. Listen, we're putting together a coloring book for kids um, so that you know, f I'll give you an example, manner of arrival. So there will be a picture of a plane, a picture of a raft, a picture of a bus, et cetera, and they will color in mm. the answer. Um, but when we go to immigration court with children, and this is separate from our shelter work, um, uh, I can tell you that, you know, I've had staff say, this is like navigating a minefield. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we want to do everything possible to help this child. Um, but, and the stakes are high. You know, if the child's life is in serious risk, if they're returned, um, we do not want that happening. And I should also mention immigration judges have been told by the Attorney General that they will be evaluated based on the number of cases they close, 700 cases minimum. Judges have complained. Uh, the the, the uh, President Emeritus of the National Association of Immigration Judges had said, and remember this, 
We hear, she's talking about immigration judges, we hear death penalty cases in a traffic court setting. Mm. Okay, so there's a lot at risk these days. All right, well, we'll come back and talk about immigration courts. 700,000 cases are pending in immigration courts in the U.S. Stay with us. We'll be right back. South Florida's medical community got a letter from you, Judy Schechter, about what was, it was early too, it was Monday, we just learned about all of this, about um, a kind of a call to action. What kind of action are you not seeing? What can the medical community do without being invited, being invited by the administration into the shelters for advice? You know, I think pediatricians take very seriously their role as advocates for children. And we know that this is harming their health, their mental health, their learning, their concentration, their memory. And so there's a lot we can do, and I think we feel responsible for that. So the response to my letter was people calling up and writing to their Congress people, going out to the rally at Homestead. Um, getting involved with um, advocacy for these kids and talking to others about the harmful effects that we know are, they're at risk for. All about the kids. Uh, Cheryl, this zero tolerance policy means, according to the Attorney General, that everyone who is caught trying to illegally enter the country, not going to a port of entry, is going to be prosecuted, but the system, you know, really just can't accommodate all those uh, cases, can it? Listen, first of all, this was a well thought out plan to punish families for daring to exercise their legal rights to, uh, to apply for, you know, relief here in this country, mm -hmm. okay? Let's be very clear about that. When, 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 when these families are being, when these parents are being criminally charged, okay, <laughs> the punish punishment should never be, and by the way, Part of this punishment, we're taking your child away. You may never see your child again. What the heck? This is the United States of America. Yeah. This is a misdemeanor. Most of these 
Parents are being released within a matter of days pleading guilty. The public defenders have complained, judges have complained. This is so, they, so ridiculous. They plead guilty and then they are deported, are they not? No, they plead guilty and, you know, if they pass a credible fear interview, um, then, but then they're in the immigration system, okay? Uh, so they're, they're here seeking legal relief. They're here seeking... Well, those who apply for asylum. But, yes, yes, yeah. I'm talking about yeah. those who apply for asylum, yes. Right. So there is um, this zero-tolerance policy sets up the separation. I know there has been, part of the problem is there's been members of the administration giving various and different reasons and comments mm -hmm. and, and so who, who knows. But there, there is part of the law parents and or adults and children cannot be detained together. That's part of the law. And so having a zero tolerance set up this sort of consequence. So now that, and, and I'm still trying to digest as we're talking this new news from uh, DHS about uh, servicing people at Port Isabel. All of a sudden now they have a servicing center where reunifications will take place. Has anybody heard any detail or no details medical about how or that legal? will happen? Um, are these children, the th a three month old, an eight year old, are they able to? An eight year old has been kept for a year. How do they find their family again? Do you right. know the, the tracking? I mean, DHS tracks look, packages every step let, of the way. Let me summarize <laughs> what what attorneys all across the country and, and other folks trying to help these kids reunite with their families have been experiencing. Utter chaos. Far too many questions and far too few answers. Um, uh, given this administration's track record, uh, on what's happened so far, it's very difficult to have a lot of faith that there's going to be a smooth, efficient process moving forward that's going to quickly reunite right. these it's families. Kind of a, a, a sad point in which to end, but we're out of time. Uh, Cheryl Little from AI Justice. Thank you, Dr. Judy Schenker. Thank you. Always God's children, great. no matter where they come from. Great to have you both. Well Thank said. you. And your insights. And up next, why it's now not about politics. It's about process and about transparency and all about those kids. Stay tuned.
This is a live look from all over South Florida at our tower camps. And here is weather authority meteorologist Erica Delgado with your Sunday forecast. Erica. Hey, good afternoon to you. We are dealing with some warm temperatures quickly warming up. Upper 80s right now in Fort Lauderdale, 85 in Miami. Winds are out of the east southeast, so that will continue to drag in patches of clouds and some showers from time to time. Now we're beginning to see them developing over the Atlantic waters, and we are seeing a few of those developing across portions of Miami-Dade. Some thunderstorms here capable of producing hail, possibly even some gusty winds just to the west of the Hialeah area approaching the turnpike. This will be the trend into the afternoon hours as we're seeing this activity develop along the sea breezes. As long as uh, the rest of the afternoon is concerned, we're expecting all these thunderstorms to continue to push out towards the interior areas and out towards the Gulf Coast, leaving for a drying evening with temperatures in the 80s. Erica, thanks. Today it has been all about the children and transparency, or in this case, lack thereof. We learned that Homestead facility had been reactivated by following a hunch, having covered its previous opening two years ago. Back then, it was specifically for the surge of teens crossing the border unaccompanied. This time, the Office of Refugee Resettlement notified a few lawmakers in February that they were reopening the shelter, but indicated it was again for those unaccompanied teens. Nowhere could we find notice to anyone that some of the children recently separated from their families because of that new zero tolerance policy were also transported there and even younger ones, including infants, transported to two other shelters in Miami-Dade. We have been denied access, open access to the shelters, even blocked from the public sidewalk in front of it. We've received conflicting numbers of children's there, leading to questions about whether Health and Human Services and or Homeland Security even knows exactly how many are there. How do they track the whereabouts of those children and their parents, whether in detention facilities or deported already? Late Saturday night, HHS and DHS suddenly announced by press release that there is a system and they have a reunification plan, but there are still, as we've talked about, no details. HHS claims privacy and security issues prevent them from answering questions. Certainly, those are factors reputable journalists know and respect as standard operating procedure. The public has a right to know and understand fully how its government is handling what has become a humanitarian catastrophe. Arguably, what journalists have documented seems to have steered the administration's moves this week. It is not about politics. It is about process and transparency until every child is back with his or her family, wherever that may be. That is our program today. Stay tuned for SoFlo Health right here next. And remember, stay informed, get involved. We'll see you next Sunday. This is a Local 10 editorial with WPLG President Bert Medina. Are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the results of the 2016 election? Regardless of the results, what really matters now is what you do in 2018. Florida voters will be making big decisions this year. We will elect a governor, a U.S. senator, members of Congress, as well as our state and local leaders. We have a right and a responsibility to be part of this process. Local 10 is committed to covering the issues and the candidates to help you make an informed decision. But you, at the end of the day, hold the power. If you're not registered to vote, do it now. And then on primary day, which is August 28, cast your vote. You can register to vote until July 30th. Registering is easy. You can do it by mail, at public libraries, or other government offices. For a complete list on how and where, visit Local10.com. But whatever you do, make sure you're registered to vote before July 30th. Of course, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Let's continue it on Local10.com. This has been a Local 10 editorial. We encourage the presentation of contrasting points of view.